Hi, City Port Church. Good morning. I trust you're having a wonderful Sunday morning, and it's a joy to be with you today and to share some great things from God's Word. My name is Craig Anderson. I'm here in Melbourne, and I uh, look forward to coming down and see you sometime in the next few months. Today, I'd like to share a message with you called When Life Serves You Up Lemons, Find Hope. And I want to just really say a big thank you to the great leadership team that is serving there in City Port Church in Portland. Thanks so much to Jacinta, Joy and Brian doing a great job leading others. Thank you to the marvellous helpers, people like Anne and Graham, Peter and Megan. Your input and love and care for people is deeply appreciated. Thank you so much for serving God with us in this movement. And we really appreciate you. And as we share today, some of the thoughts about the sort of things that happen in life. Uh, we can go through really great experiences that bring us tremendous joy and fulfillment and life and, and uh, great times. But we also go through tough times occasionally, don't we? We go through experiences that can really shake our life and cause us to even question God if it's a really deep valley. And I want to share with you some thoughts about how we handle all these things in life today. I've got a story. I'm sure you have a story too. A story about life, about the things that you have faced, the things that you have got through or maybe the things that broke you or nearly destroyed you. My troubles and sufferings are small compared to many, many people. But it's not about comparing, is it? Ultimately, only a truly selfish person wants to say, my suffering is worse than yours. For most of us, we'd love to be part of the team that brings comfort strength and hope to others that are suffering and also to be comforted at times when we need it. Most people will find great camaraderie in suffering. My mum is an amazing person. She's 96 years of age this year and when she was 28 she was pregnant with twins when they were born, one died at the age of four days and the other one was profoundly disabled. At 36, her husband died of a heart condition, forcing her to need a place for her disabled daughter in full-time care so that she could go out to work. Yet all through the years, she's been one of the most positive people I know. An amazing person. Every time I see her now in the nursing home near us, she says, I am so blessed. I am such a blessed person. You know, two people can go through the same kind of tragedy and one comes out shining and thankful. Another comes out bitter and broken. The reality is that suffering or going through tough times changes people. Life isn't fair. Sometimes. The reality is that suffering is a tough gig. When I think of the tough times I've been through, losing a dad at age seven comes to mind, losing all my hair to an autoimmune sickness during three week period when I was 35 was a bit of a challenge. Having two sons diagnosed with diabetes in one weekend and another one also with diabetes some years later. All these things certainly were a blow. But sometimes it's the dark night of the human soul that can be the hardest to bear, and I've been touched by that too. And yet I think at this time I lead a charmed life. I am well, I have an amazing wife, a great marriage, four incredible sons, 11 sensational grandkids, financially comfortable, serving in kingdom purpose. I've got very little to complain about. But whether it's challenges that you're facing, such as cost of living stress or broken relationships, financial ruin, 
or one of others life's many disasters, pain can come to us all at some point in our lives. I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say suffering's a tough gig. And there's one thing that's true, and that is that everyone suffers in some way. There's no one you meet who's been through life without a single problem or a single pain or a single difficulty or anything going wrong. We all experience different levels of tough times. And there's two things about tough times that are hard to bear. The first one is pain and the second injustice. Pain is hard to bear because we have to endure that pain. Pain can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be psychological, it can be financial. Pain can be the result of illness, loss, persecution, even spiritual attack. But there's also the aspect of injustice. Suffering is hard to endure because so often we believe it's undeserved, it's unjust. If we suffer at the hands of evil men, that's unjust. To be a victim of crime is really hard to bear. If I drop a hammer on my toe, I may suffer pain, but at least I've got somebody to blame, right? But many times there's no one to blame. So we blame God. After all, God knows everything, right? And he, isn't he sovereign? Doesn't he control everything? The question of suffering has challenged mankind since the beginning of any philosophical debate. Here's the argument philosophers and atheists often put forward. God is supposed to be all-knowing, all-powerful and all-loving, right? So if God allows evil to continue because he can't stop it, then he's all-loving but he isn't all-powerful. But if he allows it to continue because he doesn't care, then he may be all-powerful but he isn't all-loving. The problem with this argument is that it assumes we have perfect knowledge. That we know without any doubt what is good and right for us. In other words, we have a complete perspective. A man by the name of William Alston, the emeritus professor at Syracuse University, says this. The effort to demonstrate that evil disproves God in philosophical circles, is now acknowledged by almost all sides to be completely bankrupt. There hasn't been a major philosophical work in almost 25 years using this idea, trying to prove the non-existence of God. And here's the reason why. When you say there can't be a God if there is pointless, senseless evil and suffering, how do you know that evil and suffering is senseless? How do you know it's pointless? You might say, I can't think of any good reason why God would allow it. Ah, then what you're saying is that when you can't think of a good reason to allow suffering and evil, that there isn't one or there can't be one. And this is not a valid argument. Suffering is part of the human condition Everyone suffers at some degree at all times. Some suffer far more than others. Some, in a way, every human experiences pain of some kind. Some people overcome and rise above it. Some are destroyed by it. Some are philosophical, others are destroyed by pain. If you're an atheist, you better accept pain as part of the survival of the fittest. A kind of natural selection, so grin and bear it. But don't bother the Christians with arguments for the non-existence of God. If you're a Christian, you have hope, because God says a lot about suffering. And he knows when you are suffering. He has a way to make suffering create a better outcome for you and also he joins you in that suffering. 
in Christianity, think about this for a minute, the only world religion where God experiences suffering. That's got to mean something, right? Everybody reacts in their own way to suffering. Some are, There are plenty of people who have experienced suffering and it's led them to God. And there's plenty of people who have turned away from God because of suffering. What we can know for sure is that God exists. That, as Romans 8.28 says, He is all loving and all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if evil and suffering are part of life, would it make sense to work with God so that the purpose and outcome of suffering is for good? Ultimately, you may never receive a complete understanding about the suffering you're going through. But being a follower of Jesus Christ means you have a deep, abiding trust that God is for you. God is with you and God has your best interests at heart. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is walking through your pain with you and promises comfort and hope. So you can rail against suffering and pain or you can trust Allow God's greater purpose to take effect. We aren't called to enjoy suffering. We're called to endure suffering. And it's okay to take a painkiller when you need it, but not illicit drugs, okay? As we think about the tough things that people have been through in life, I want you to consider the life of Joseph in the Bible. Here's a story about suffering where we actually get to see the reason for suffering. A story where we have almost perfect perspective thanks to God's word giving us the whole picture. Genesis 37 to 50 is a lot of chapters about a young man called Joseph. He receives a dream from God that his 11 brothers and his mother and father will bow down to him. His jealous brothers sell him into slavery, betrayal by his nearest and dearest. Then he's doing well in Egypt, serving his master Potiphar. When Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of rape and he goes to prison, betrayal by his boss and wife. Then in prison, he interprets a dream by both the king's cupbearer and baker. The cupbearer is restored to service with the king, but fails to make good on his promise to put in a good word for Joseph to Pharaoh, the betrayal of a good friend. Later, by a miracle of God, Pharaoh has a dream and the cupbearer finally speaks up and tells Pharaoh about Joseph and his ability to interpret dreams. And Joseph gets out of jail and makes it to become the prime minister of Egypt and puts a plan into place that feeds the whole of the known world for seven years through a time of famine. So it's easy for us to see the hand of God working and preparing Joseph for world-changing outcomes this is because we have perspective. But how would Joseph have felt when he was in prison, knowing the outcome, not knowing the outcome that lay ahead for him? How could have Joseph reacted in this circumstance? He could have gone into deep despair, crippled by the betrayal of brothers and have wasted away in prison. He could have blamed God for giving him a dream that was obviously never going to come to pass and why would he taunt him? He could have become angry and turned to violence, lashing out at others in the prison. Did he have perspective? Did he have an explanation of how it would all turn out in the end? Did he have anything to give him hope other than a dream he had as a teenager? With so little to go on, how did he endure hardship? 
and sufferings and eventually come out on top? The answer is, he had faith in the goodness of God. My favourite story of hope is um, an amazing missionary man called William Carey who went to India. Listen to what Joseph says in the end of his life about the sufferings he went through. This is in Genesis chapter 50, verses 18 through 21. Then his brothers went and fell down before him in confession, and they said, Behold, we are your servants, your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Vengeance is his, not mine. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present outcome, that many people would be kept alive as they are this day. So now do not be afraid. I will provide for you and support you and your little ones. So he comforted them and giving them encouragement and hope and spoke with kindness to their hearts. What an amazing experience that must have been. Joseph at that time would have been able to look back over a, a long life of troubles and difficulties and turmoil, betrayal, mistrust, pain. How many nights did he spend in prison thinking to himself, does God even know I'm here? Does God even care for me? But something kept him going. A spark on the inside kept telling him, God is for me. God knows me. God called me. God loves me. He kept his faith strong in the face of incredible difficulties and tough times. As I mentioned a moment ago, the story of William Carey is one that's really encouraged me through the years. And William Carey was a preacher in England. And God put on his heart to go to England as a missionary to preach the gospel there. It was a hard gig. The church really didn't, didn't even want to support him. They weren't interested in giving him uh finances or help to get there but begrudgingly after a long time of trying to persuade them they eventually sent him off to India to preach the gospel to a nation that had not heard the gospel and he reached there he began a plantation uh, to earn a living and income he began translating the Bible into Sanskrit he began sharing the gospel each night of the week he preached, I think it was six nights a week, he preached the gospel to whoever would come and listen. He found one other person who had become a Christian and who was helping him to translate the Bible. And through this period, the uh, plantation he had was uh, destroyed by fire. His wife was uh, suffering a great deal of mental illness, almost went crazy. I think one of his children died. And after many years of preaching the gospel, not one person had come to Christ. And the man who was a Christian, who had been helping him to translate the Bible into Sanskrit, actually backslid. And after all these tough times, he writes a letter back to the church in England. And he says this, Though my disappointments may yet be 1,000 times greater, yet I have this knowledge, the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And I'm thinking, wow, how could he say that? How could he do that? How could he have such hope? But you see, he had a connection, a connection to God, a connection to Jesus. And over his lifespan, he actually led 
literally hundreds of people to Christ, translated the Bible into more than one language and left behind as he passed away an incredible missionary organization that continued to share the gospel in India and created an incredible life change for literally thousands and thousands of people. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you've been through some really tough times. Maybe you're needing hope. Maybe you're needing somebody to just come and stand beside you and say, let me encourage you. God calls us to weep with them that weep, to rejoice with them that rejoice. Sometimes it isn't what we say that really helps. It's just being able to be there. If they've shed a tear, that you shed one as well. And if you're the one that's going through the tough times, it's knowing that somebody else is there to just encourage you and say, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Can I do the shopping? Can I mow your lawn? Can I make your meal? Can I help you with something practical? Can I listen as you share the thoughts that are going through your heart and mind? And most of all, can I pray for you? Can I share with you the wonder of the Holy Spirit being our comforter? Are you struggling, going through tough times, wondering what's going to happen next, wondering if there's any good news around the corner? Have you been through the dark midnight of the human soul? Have you given up believing that there's a God who cares? I've got good news for you today. There is real hope. God loves you and he wants to come and comfort you, but you need to open up your heart. Let him in. Run to God for your final hope and your ultimate answers. Maybe this message today can be something that you can grab off YouTube and share it with somebody you know that's going through a deep, dark time of trouble. And just be there for them and say, hey, how can I be a help to you? I want to pray today for you. I want to pray for the church. I want to pray for anybody you know that might be going through tough times that you might be able to be a resource to them that you might be able to be a person who's able to overcome in your own situation no matter what difficulties you face so let's pray together heavenly father we know that we need you so much we need your great great love we need to Open our lives to the power of the Holy Spirit. You are the one that sent to us, Holy Spirit, as the great comforter. Thank you for comforting us through our tough times. We pray today, Lord, that you would be there with every person in the church at Portland. Father, that you would also encourage us, equip us and enable us to be there for others outside the church who really need a word of encouragement just now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Clothe us, empower us, and strengthen us to be people that overcome. And we thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks for, for being here with us today in church. And uh, right throughout our movement, there's a tremendous movement of prayer taking place. We, we find that God is regenerating our passion and our hope for the good things that lie in front of us in our movement. It's our 50th anniversary year this year. There's a great conference taking place in the 2nd to the 4th of July in Brisbane at City Point Church. If you're able to get up there, I'd love you to consider that. Um, but it's a year when I believe God is doing something great in our movement to encourage people in prayer, to seek him, to know that God has a tremendous plan for Australia. 
a plan to see our nation come to Christ. And uh, it's just great to be part of that great plan of God. So thank you for being that uh, team there at Portland as well. God bless you. Have a fantastic day. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless. Bye-bye.